here we go. Welcome to the Tech Meets Mental Health interview series. In this series, our host, Professor Skip Rizzo, will be engaging in dialogue with various experts in the digital mental health field across the course of the series. Today, our host, Professor Rizzo, will interview our amazing We'll interview our amazing speaker, Dr. Barbara Rothbone. She is the director of Emory Healthcare Veterans Program. The Tech Meets Mental Health series is presented by Cognitive Leap. Cognitive Leap is a pioneer in the area of digital diagnostic and therapeutic systems designed to address ADHD and other cognitive and mental health conditions. Leveraging advances in virtual reality and using mobile web-based app applications Cognitive Leap takes a human-centric, clinician-driven approach to create and deliver assessment and intervention tools. Our company has a strong research and development team with world-renowned experts who focus on neurology, cognition, psychology, engineering, and artificial intelligence. We're currently working on an FDA study for the approval of our virtual reality classroom, diagnosing ADHD in children. Our expert in virtual reality and today's host is Professor Skip Rizzo. Skip Rizzo is a professor at USC and director of medical virtual reality. He serves as an advisor and chief science officer for Cognitive Leap, exploring methods to address attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in children. Our guest, Dr. Barbara Rothbaum, is the director of the Emory Healthcare Veterans Program and the Paul A. Jansen Chair in Neuropsychopharmacology at the Emory University of Medicine. Dr. Rothbaum specializes in research on the treatment of anxiety disorders, specifically PTSD. She was a member of the Institute of Medicine's study on assessment of ongoing efforts in the treatment of PTSD and briefed the DOD, VA, House, and Senate committees on Veterans Affairs and Armed Services Committees on the IOM report result. She has authored over 400 scientific papers and chapters and has published 11 books on the treatment of PTSD. Her most recent book is on PTSD for the general public and is titled PTSD, What Everyone Needs to Know. During the interview, our participants who are joining us from the webinar can directly ask, the que ask questions through the Q&A window, while participants from the YouTube live stream can also ask questions in the live chat. We will have around 10 minutes at the end to answer your questions. So let's turn it over to Professor Rizzo and Dr. Rothbaum. All righty. Well, thank you, Sherry. Uh, appreciate the introduction. And Barbara, thank you so much for being here. Um, when you agreed to do the podcast, uh, I got really excited because um, there's just so much to talk about. Then I started to get nervous because there's too much to talk about. We're not, we're just not going to be able to pack it in uh, to an hour, but we're going to give it a good shot. Um, Always leave them wanting more. That's right. That's right. I, I've learned that from you. Um, you know, you, you're an unsung hero or you're a hero that's very well sung in a lot of circles but when i look at the current crop of people that are doing vr and so on they always cite your articles but i'm not sure if they've heard you know your story like how you got involved in it you know for the audience barbara worked with larry hodges back in the early to mid 90s building the very first company that was producing virtual reality for clinical purposes virtually better um, but it wasn't just like i'm going to go into building a business it was informed by the research and they published uh, some of the very first papers on uh, exposure therapy for anxiety disorders and so forth i didn't meet you barbara until i think it was 97 but i 98 maybe at a, a AABT conference, American Association of Behavior Therapists, which has changed now uh, to ABCT. But um, but we had phone calls because I was writing papers and I wanted to, to get the real scoop on somebody who had come before with this. Anyway, what was that moment that um, that 
that got you into this crazy field, 93, 92, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, so it was Larry Hodges, who was at Georgia Tech. I'm at Emory and was at Emory then. And there was a grant, a seed grant program, and you needed a Georgia Tech and an Emory investigator. And he was a computer scientist working on virtual reality. I've been doing exposure therapy my whole career. And he called me up to see if I wanted to collaborate on this. And I remember saying, you want to do, you want to do what? <laughs> <laughs> and he makes fun of me that I, I made him send me his CV to, to show me that he was legitimate. We, we wrote that grant and I can always date it when we did it because I had one section due to him on a Tuesday and that Monday I went into labor and that kid was born in February, 1993. So I can always date it. He didn't know me that well then. He thought that was the end of the grant, but we got the grant in, we got the grant. And that was using virtual reality to treat the fear of heights. And we published that study in 1995 in the American Journal of Psychiatry. And, and I think that was the first published study using VR to treat a psychological or psychiatric disorder. And there was a huge response. And Emory and Georgia Tech thought that there could be a marketable product here. So I don't know if this is TMI, but they, they literally took us by the hand, took us to a lawyer to incorporate and, and that's virtually better. Um, and so I think that, I guess that was in 95 that we incorporated and virtually better is still here. So I always disclose I'm full-time at Emory. I'm a professor in psychiatry, but I am a part owner of virtually better, which knock on wood is still in existence. I, you know, that's just amazing because, you know, we've all seen uh, VR companies come and go over the years. Um, and somehow you had the staying power 27 years. I mean, you tell that to people that have just come into the field, you know, maybe two days after the Oculus Quest was announced. And, uh, and they're like, they can't even imagine uh, that. What were, what were some of the challenges early on with that? What, what did oh, you there, were, there were lots of challenges. And since I'm a clinical researcher, that's the approach that we took. And so we would write grants to try something out. And so that was our R&D that would help us develop an application, but then we would design a clinical trial to test it. And so to do it properly, we would write a treatment manual that would say how to do it. And then we would have data. And then if we got a phase two small business grant, we'd have control data via RCT and we'd publish the paper um, and we had a treatment manual saying how to do it. So it was replicable right away. There were lots of challenges. Every time we found a head mounted display that we liked, we would work with it and then they'd go out of business. <laughs> and then we have to find another one that we liked and, you know, and, you know, then change everything. Originally we started, I think it was, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, I think it was a Silicon Graphics workstation. So it was a huge computer and in that first study, the computer wasn't even in the same room with us. And it took a brilliant computer science graduate student to, to make any changes. So I'd be in the room with the patient and I'd be, you know, through an intercom, Rob, can you take us to the fifth floor, please? And then, you know, the graduate student in the next room. I mean, now, obviously, everything is, you know, on a, on a PC, on a laptop, you know, on a, on a phone and a standalone head mount display. Um, convincing them what we wanted to do. I remember uh, the second application I kept asking for after the fear of heights was successful. I wanted a virtual airplane. It was such a pain. I'm in Atlanta, busiest airport in the world. But if I have a patient with a fear of flying, it's a real pain for me to go to the airport if I have to fly with them. And now, you know, since 9-11, you can't even get past security with them. And so when we, you know, I would go back and forth to Georgia Tech when we were building it and try to tell them what are some of the cues that scare people, you know, that you want to make sure you have in there. And I remember Larry Hodges, the computer scientist, he's rubbing his hands. He said, you know, we can crash this thing. It's like, no, you don't get the idea. <laughs> That's not what we're trying to do. <laughs> so, um, I mean, 
I have said it all along. I keep saying it. If it were easy, everyone would do it. So there were there were a lot of challenges, and that's the fun part is working them out. Yeah, you know, um, a lot of times you hear the, the quote that it's 15 years from bench to bedside. Um, in some ways, VR immediately went to bedside, if you will. You know, you used it in clinical practice after a couple of years, but it really hasn't gotten you know feasible you kept virtually better afloat and which is ad remarkable admirable um but at the same time you know the, it, did you think it was going to take as long to get where we are now with the technology um back then i know my i had an i was under the illusion when i started up in this that you know all right we're building something in 95 96 uh, by 2000, it's going to be just the way I want it. And I didn't realize it was going to take so long. What about yeah, I, I didn't either. I thought I thought every therapist would have a head mount display in their office by now, especially exposure therapists, um, substance abuse treaters, you know, for Q exposure therapy. I mean, I thought there were going to be so many applications. Your virtual classroom, I thought that would just be, that would be how... Yeah, ADD and ADHD got tested now, you know, I thought, you know, so I did think that it would be adopted and a lot more widespread. Now, just a little bit after the fear of flying, I think it was around 97, 98, a lot of people don't realize this, you know, that a lot of people think, you know, our Brave Mind uh, application, which we work together on was like the first PTSD thing. They don't realize before that was World Trade Center, but you were the first person to take on this challenge of using VR to treat PTSD with virtual Vietnam. How, what, how did that come about? Did you get a lot of pushback? Um, yeah, so, I mean, at that point, the Vietnam veterans that were still in the system were considered treatment resistant and we'd had some success with this virtual reality. And I really liked it a lot for exposure therapy. So I thought, you know, could it help these Vietnam veterans? We knew it was a potent stimulus, but we were also scared. We didn't know how potent a stimulus. We started, it was for outpatients. We set it up on the inpatient unit. So we had all of this support right there, just in case someone decompensated. At the end of one of them, the Huey helicopter, it has male voices yelling, move out, move out when it lands. And we were scared they'd rip off the head mount display and jump out of the helicopter. And at the time it was a $14,000 head mount display. So we tethered it to the ceiling. So just in case they did rip it off, it, it wouldn't hit the floor. Um, and then we were kind of making it up as we went. I remember the first, patient we had in there he had been a helicopter pilot in Vietnam so it it matched his experience perfectly as soon as he got in so this was it was still hard to incorporate digital images but we had we had uh had gone to an air force base Dobbins Air Force Base near Atlanta and taken digital photos of a Huey helicopter and so it was an actual you know, digital image. We had the patch on the back of the helmet. And as soon as he got in, he said, I had a patch like that on the back of my helmet. You could tell, felt immersed immediately. But we didn't, you know, we were still figuring out how to use it for PTSD. So at first we had let him have a few sessions just wandering around and then wandering around and talking about memories that came up and then really going deep into the exposure. So we ended up treating him for 14 sessions. Wow. And we, you know, we wore it out of them, but so we got a little bit more efficient as we went along, but we, we were encouraged because we did see that it was helpful and nobody decompensated, you know, all of those safeguards we had in place weren't necessary. Well, you know, I think that's been borne out over the years, you know, a lot of the, you know, kind of old school, uh, anti-technology type clinicians, always bring that up. Oh, it's, you're going to overstimulate a person. They're going to decompensate. They're going to re-trigger, re-traumatize people. And, you know, it really hasn't borne out in that um, the Journal of uh, Anxiety Disorders uh, special issue that you edited with Mark Powers in uh, 2019, there was a really good deterioration uh, analysis where 
they, you know, deterioration analyses, I think are really important because it's not just about bragging about all the people you fix, but looking at the negative, uh, you know, impact or if people didn't benefit or got worse. And that, that deterioration analysis showed that it was uh, no different than any other psychological um, active psychological treatment and much better than wait list. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think we kind of saw that when we did the, uh, the military sexual trauma study, that was one that everybody was like, you know, kind of worried about, Oh, we get it for combat related PTSD, but sexual trauma, come on. And that was why it was so important having you because you had a, this long history of working with exposure in sexual trauma beyond VR. Um, you know, and, and I think that was encouraging findings. Any comments on, on, on this area? No. Yeah, no. And that was a, a great study. And, and I mean, that's the title of it. You can do that, you know, using VR for military sexual trauma. We, you know, just so people know, we did not present the perpetrator. So we didn't present anything scary. What we're doing when we're doing virtual reality exposure therapy for PTSD is basically prolonged exposure therapy. So we're having the person go back in their mind's eye to the time of the traumatic event, recount it out loud in the present tense. But now their eyes are open because they're wearing a head mounted display and the therapist is matching what they're describing. And I think what you and I have both learned over the years, over the decades is less is more. And, and in VR, I mean, it is a potent stimulus. And so you don't have to bombard them with stimuli. So in the MST study, a lot of times it was just having the person in the room that resembled it, you know, in the environment, on the base, um, in a latrine, in, in a vehicle. Uh, a, one of the stimuli that we used a lot was the sound of heavy breathing. So maybe just the setting and the sound of heavy breathing, and then they're telling the story and they're back there and it was effective. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, you know, in a lot of, a lot of these areas, the, you know, the, the VR context, the, the visuals kind of set the stage, but a lot of times it's the audio that uh, drives emotion. I, if you recall in the, um, in the brave mind application, we have a, an audio clip of a baby crying and that one we've heard from a lot of folks that you know when say a bomb goes off in the distance and then you hear this this sound of a baby crying that's really emotionally evocative i think more so uh than the visuals uh the good news is i think i have a line on funding now to actually bring the uh the military sexual trauma project back online uh an update based on the feedback from from your group on uh, what we need to do to make it a little bit better and relevant. And because we had to build all that civilian content for it as well, since, you know, a lot of sexual trauma in the military is not happening. It didn't happen in trenches of Afghanistan. It's happening around bases and in the, in the U S and so on. So I think I have a line of funding to be able to evolve that so that it could be ready for civilian uh, sexual trauma in the near future. So that would be terrific. That yeah. Would be terrific. Yeah. Yeah, um, you're right. I, I agree with you. I think a lot of times it's those auditory cues. I mean, hearing, you know, the gunfire in Brave Mind, um, hearing the dog barking, you know, would, would get people. I mean, and I also like, so we place people on the raised platform with the woofer underneath. So for example, you can feel the vibrations of the Humvee with the engine on. You can feel the vibrations of the explosions or the rotors of the helicopter. And I, I think that that all of it together, it is a potent stimulus. So you're in the memory, you're seeing it, you're feeling it, you're hearing it. And in some cases you're smelling it because we can deliver the olfactory cues as well. And um, that's part of why I like VR so much for PTSD because PTSD is a disorder of avoidance. And I think it's harder to avoid in in the vr for ptsd you're you're just you're in it from so many senses you know do you think that um the general field in clinical psychology at least has gotten more accepting of, of these forms of treatment i know you've got a lot of pushback from some of the 
leaders in the field um, at the time in traditional exposure therapy and other areas. Uh, do you think we we're past that now? I'm, I'm not sure. You know, I do still hear from people, why is it necessary? You know, traditional exposure therapy is so effective. CPT is so effective. Why do you need all of this? So I, I think maybe where the money is at the end of the day, not real money, but, you know, figuring it out, is figuring out which treatment for whom and figuring out, you know, for example, in Joanne DeFede's World Trade Center study, I think a lot of those patients had been through traditional exposure therapy and not improved. And then they did well in the VR therapy. And so I think, you know, I mean, that's where we're going in general. I think with personalized medicine, trying to figure out which treatment for whom to be the most efficient. Yeah, I think that's really where um, I agree. That's where the money is, is uh, being able to predict. Because VR isn't for everybody, but for some people, like what we found in the recent uh, RCT that's under review about, um, you know, folks with comorbid depression, uh, being able to, you know, perform, getting better at clinical outcomes um, um, in our trial with VR, we're able to activate them in ways that they might not be able to activate themselves on their own. Uh, right. And I think, I mean, I think an area where it could be really useful and we can really get traction is in assessment. Um, I, I think, you know, we use it, we've got the Emory Healthcare Veterans Program, where we're able to fly people in from all around the country, post 9-11 veterans, for two-week IOP, intensive outpatient program. They get a lot of therapy every day, more therapy than most people get in a year. And we are, we like these more objective measures, assessments before and after treatment. And so, you know, that with the, with the Brave Mind clips, we created three two-minute standard clips, the convoy, the Humvee driving down a desert highway and a Middle Eastern city on foot patrol. And we embedded acoustic startle probes in those clips and in blue screens in between to look at the startle reaction and to look at other physiological reactions because that's part of what's going on with PTSD. You know, people get triggered and, and they feel a sense of threat. And there's really no blood test for PTSD. There's no, you know, like diabetes or blood pressure. And so if we can move towards more objective measurement, and I love VR for that because it's an activating paradigm. You're able to put them in the situation and present them with cues and see how their body reacts. And so, for example, we were able to see that the startle response decreases with treatment and stays lower months later. Salivary cortisol decreases with treatment and stays lower months later. So I, I think that VR has a lot of potential for assessment and a lot of different kinds of assessment. Well, you know, that's, that's always been the case, the ultimate Skinner box, if you will, you've got a controlled stimulus environment and wh whether you uh, can put somebody in the same environment and observe change over time, pre-treatment, post, and so on. Or you can have normative data, like the, you know the environment around behind me here, the virtual classroom. You know that's a controlled stimulus environment for assessment. Um, it allows us to systematically present distracting stimuli in a functionally relevant environment. And, you know, the opportunities for this when you've developed a normative database, particularly, which we've now developed uh, uh, some data I'll have to show you on the side here. Um, pretty, pretty remarkable to, when you look across age groups and you see systematic improvements um, in neurotypical kids over the, you know, going from age six to 13, like you would expect. And then some differences between males and females. It, this is a, set, a data set of about 700 kids. Um, you really see that now we're on the verge of really being able to inform our diagnostics in these environments in a way that, that wasn't possible. But, you know, it's the systematic control. That's the beauty of it within this contained environment. You look at an assessment in any neuropsychologist's office, you know, there's a poster of a bunny on the wall or there's a window off to the left. And meanwhile, the kid is interacting with a stranger doing a digit span or sitting in front of a 
computer screen doing a TOVA. And there's so much variability in that context. So just like with the PTSD um, assessment work, I think, it, which which r- reminds me, I want to get back to PTSD You talk about the future and, and different populations, but you've done some work developing apps with kids. You did um, the, the social skill app, I think it was around 2013, 2014, somewhere around there. Uh, what do you think about the feasibility of um, of using VR with kids? Well, the, um, I actually, I think the first time we did use VR with kids, it was in a pediatric population undergoing painful medical procedures, and we used it as a distraction. And and we we also gathered heart rate and some physiological measures during that. And we definitely saw improvement on all of the measures we were looking at, but they, everyone loved it. So the kids loved it, the nurses loved it, and the parents loved it because some of these kids would just go crazy. These were kids with cancer. So they kind of knew, had had experience with some of these procedures and some of them, it was very upsetting for them. And we, we also had a pretty good comparison because we would, we presented the exact same content, but on a monitor on a flat screen monitor. So, and then we also compared it to their regular distraction because they use distraction with these kids all the time. They had videos and things and the VR still did better. So there really is something about the immersion that was, that was useful. And that's where I first realized that kids love VR. And I also, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the, the kid that was born in 93. So I'm working on VR applications and I've got kids and they love it. I mean, they they love everything, and they've got a, such a suspension of belief in the VR airplane. One of them, at a young age, he says, "Are we in an airplane?" <laughs> um, and so, yeah. So I think so. Kids do love VR, and it's a it's a great medium to to work with them. And so, yeah, we've done social skills training. Um, we've in terms of also like how to respond to a bully, how to um, yeah. give give feedback if um, a kid has a food allergy, you know, what are things you can do to help go to sleep? What are different anxiety management skills and teaching them through VR? So I think, I think it's got a, a great life ahead of it for kids. Yeah. I, 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 think, yeah. I, I wanna, I wanna go back. Cause I think, you know, when we were talking about, you were talking about like the control that VR offers us for assessment. Um, I, I wanna, I love it also in clinical trials for that methodological control. So we first used it with a medication, I think when we did the decycloserine studies. And when you're combining, and like you said, you know, in assessment, it's usually kind of soft. There are a lot of things going around. In, in trials and even randomized controlled trials, psychotherapy arm is usually like a little bit softer. You know, I may not do it exactly the same way you do, even if we monitor it, you know, there's a little bit of difference. And if you're presenting it in VR, you can make sure that every single patient gets exactly the same stimulus, exactly the same exposure to it. And, you know, at the time we did it, they're not going to get any exposure to it outside of the experimental conditions. So we were able to use it with the decycloserine study. And um, just for people who don't know, decycloserine is an NMDA. There's a lot of popularity of MDMA. This is an NMDA partial agonist. And it was shown in an animal model to facilitate the extinction of fear, but it had been FDA approved. So we wanted to do it with people. So we did it with the fear of heights and we presented the heights in the virtual reality. And so it was beautiful for methodological control. And I think that's an advantage that VR has in combining it with medication or even in assessment, like for use of a medication. You know, for example, um, we had some VR environments of substance use and using environments. And you can hook people up and get their craving and figure out exactly the point that their craving increases. And for example, if you're working on a pharmaceutical that'll decrease craving, make sure it works there. You know, you can do it in a safe VR environment before you put them out on the street. So I, I love VR for that <laughs> methodological control. 
I, I think combination studies are, uh, there's going to be a lot more of them, combinations of pharmacological agents and using VR exactly for the reason you say. I'm surprised that more pharmaceutical companies haven't invested, although I've been hearing a lot lately that that is a movement. Uh, you know, I've done some consulting with a small pharma company that is putting a toe in the water and there's a couple of other groups that actually have some funding in that way. I, you know, I think like, we had done the study with the original virtual classroom uh, with kids on and off medications and before and after, and, you know, found exactly what you would, you would expect, you know, at a, um, you know, that without the medication, their performance, you know, was way below the normative data, but after the medication, it was, you know, these were kids that were well-diagnosed and were properly um, at a, at a dose level that they should be at. And so, you know, it's a, it's exactly what you would, you would want to have better consistency of measurement when there's a pharmacological agent involved. I think there's I, a lot I, of, I, I got to tell you your clip of the early clip of the kid, um, where they've got, you have the assessment of where his eye gaze <laughs> is and with the airplane going by, that's iconic. Um, I mean, if there is a, a VR museum one day, it'll it'll be virtual, I'm sure. But they got to have that clip in there. That is just iconic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was like a that was like a hit record. Uh, that yeah. clip. No, you it know. is. I love the you know kids head yeah. bopping around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I hope there is going to be a VR museum someday <laughs> because I got you know, a storage bin full of yeah. headsets from the nineties and all the way through. And I should have had those in my background. I do. I've got a, I've got them too. Yep. 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 Um, okay. So uh, just real quick back to um, PTSD stuff. What do you see in the future? Um, I I've been on the stump talking about um, that, you know, trauma is ubiquitous. Certainly when you look at what's going on in Ukraine right now, um, you want to talk about a, a mental health challenge when the dust settles from this, but what, what, what's your view on, on other populations that we should uh, be thinking about? Yeah. Um, so again, I love VR as an assessment, um, and as an objective standardized assessment, and especially for trying to assess more objective measures of PTSD and biomarkers, you know, to, to see what happens. So I think that, that, and, you know, being able to figure out how to do that more easily and maybe more mobily, but I think that it's going to, it's great as an assessment. I think it's great as a treatment and, you know, maybe for folks who are very avoidant, um, but again, we still have to figure out who exactly needs it. Who, who is it good for? And then sometimes at the, in the veterans program, so our standard treatment is regular PE, um, but we've got, I think, three or four systems, VR systems, and people will use it especially to give them like burst of the stimuli. Like if people are very, very easily startled and they really do need to get used to the sounds, we'll put them in the VR. Um, and so being able to use it in, even in certain situations, I mean, we've got the luxury of having it, so, so we use it. Um, but there, you know, for example, motor vehicle crashes, that is the number one cause of PTSD in men in the United States. And, you know, so that is obviously in an area that we could work in with VR. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm leaning to, into the, um, the police and first responder yep. area. It, it's a hard nut to crack, uh, just like service members that don't want to admit they're having a problem. It's even harder uh, with police officers. Uh, you know, there was a recent study showing that with anonymous assessments, uh, self-report assessments, 25% uh, of the sample, about 300 people, um, would, you know, would have a mental health condition. Um, and 5% actually have sought help for it. So getting them into treatment, I, I'm, I'm thinking about the idea of embedding it as a training thing, like a, a, a social de-escalation training thing. And then, like you say, with the assessment end use of it. Use it as the assessment. Use the assessment and let, the, let their bodies tell you what's going on. You know, and then, and then I, I also think it would take some of the stigma out if it's a physio, you know, people will go for an EKG or treadmill test or, you know, MRI or something. 
if this is in my body, you know, and then, and it's not me, you know, sounding like a wimp or something like that. So I, I really am very much in favor of using it for a psychophysiological assessment and letting their bodies tell the yep. doc what's going on. Yep. And then, you know, then, you know, perhaps then you call it training, but mm -hmm. it's, it's really kind of thinly veiled exposure practice and escalating or de-escalating certain circumstances. And I think there's a way in for that. And I think it's something we have to recognize that, you know, folks on the front lines of police, firefighting, first responders, they're confronted all the time yep. um, with these difficult experiences. You know, another area, and uh, you know, re going back to kids again now, um, there, you know, there's so much research now on adverse childhood experiences and its impact later on in life, whether it's um, a higher propensity for obesity or um, di diabetes or, you know, a whole spectrum of cardiovascular uh, problems later on in life, but also functional challenges. Kids that have more of these adverse childhood experiences have a higher delinquency rate, don't finish high school, uh, higher percentage, more, you know, substance use problems. Um, you know, uh, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to put a young child in something traumatic um, or the reminiscent of the kinds of trauma. But I'm thinking about the teenage population while they're still young enough to have some impact. If you could do something that helps them to tell their story and mm -hmm. helps them to, um, you know, confront some of the misconceptions they may have about their responsibility in the abuse they may have suffered. And so, well, uh, yeah, I mean, Esther Devlinger and Judith Coyne's treatment for kids and um, they had Esther spent time with us when I was at Edna Foa's place and, you know, learning the exposure therapy from us. And they're they often use anatomically correct dolls to help the kids, you know, if, if they don't really have the words for what happened, you know, act out and kind of show what happened. And at, I agree, I wouldn't put a kid that young you know, probably in VR and redoing things, but, you know, VR could be like the next step, you know, right. instead of anatomically correct dolls. And, you know, kids like it so much and kids are used to gaming so much. In some ways I can, I can picture an environment where the kids can almost control some of the elements like they can in the dolls, you know, um, and let them kind of like we do with the therapist interface for the brave mind, you know, in some ways, maybe let the kids do something like that and let them tell their story and put it together, how it happened. That's just an idea. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a good idea. You know, um, I don't know if you've seen, you know, it can, in play therapy, they use this uh, sand tray approach, mm -hmm. you know, and, it, and the whole thing is to help kids that maybe can't verbalize things that have gone on to tell it in a story with these representational objects. Well, there's a woman, Jessica Stone, who's built a virtual sand tray. And so that, you know, you can, with a touchpad, build out the world and tell your story and pick the, the, what the, the lighting, just like we do in Brave Mind, in nighttime, daytime, you know, fog, whatever. And then they can put on a headset and walk through and tell their story in whatever representational way. Uh, therapists can put on a headset and go into the world they've created. So you're giving a kid an opportunity to build a world you're not foisting it on them and i think there might be some some value in that um and i think that that's something that really deserves um, more attention again i would start more with uh you know young teenagers and then maybe work your way down but it is such a, a significant problem um that has yeah and i think and I think, I mean, and this is for, you know, for me too, I think in some ways we're, we're still too bound by reality, even with virtual reality. Um, and I think that there could be so many more creative ways that could be therapeutic, but I mean, it's, it's testable, you know, it's an empirical yeah. question, you know, we should try it, test it and see if it works. But you know, the, I mean, that's the beauty of VR. We're not bound by reality, but so many of our applications are really still pretty ground in reality. And, you know, when you think about kids and what they might need, that might be an area that we could get more creative. Um, what, um, 
What's your view now, after all these years, about the current state of VR? And also, you know, from uh, taking off the academic hat and looking at, you know, from the virtually better um, position, um, what, what's, held, what's held this back from being a massive business proposition? You've done well. But we're, 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 we haven't made any money. <laughs> we're still here. <laughs> that, was, that was always one of my fears. If somebody's going to make a lot of money at VR and it's not going to be me. Well, it hadn't been, that hadn't been me yet. <laughs> um, and I'm not in it for the money. Obviously, I'm an academic. You know, we, it's a hobby almost. Like, a, But um, now there have been a lot of things that held us back. So the, and you know this, the, the cost of creating a virtual environment. Um, so that takes specialized people. It takes a lot of time. I mean, we don't even try to come close to the gaming environments. And I don't think we need to because it's not, I mean, that's what we found out early on. And in some ways in that very first study, that was the computer science scientist interest in doing these VR studies to see almost what is the minimal stimulus that can make people feel present in virtual reality. And so we know with fear and anxiety, it doesn't take much to trigger it. So it doesn't need to you know, have that level of, of realism. But it's still, it's expensive to create and it takes a lot of time. The equipment has come down a lot, but that has been an impediment all along. You know, just the, the price of the equipment. I mean, even that it's anything. You know, and yeah, you know, I guess the last impediment is our people's attitudes about it. If what I'm doing seems to work fine, and if I'm full, you know, I don't have, um, I don't need to attract new people. Why do I need to spend money and learn something different? It is, there are a lot of obstacles to trying to teach somebody something new. And so, and getting them to learn something new and then to pay money for it most people don't see the need. So I think, I think we have to, uh, you know, who was it? Wayne Gretzky's father, you know, think, don't look, think of where the puck's going to, you know, where the puck is, think of where the puck's going to be. You know, we need to, to think what are people's needs and how can this fulfill a need that maybe they don't even know they have yet. Right. Right. You know, I think you touched on an important topic and that's clinician training. Um, You know, I know you've done a good bit of that. And I, I think there's a, a lot of room for much more. I mean, I regularly uh, get queries. Where can I go to a school to learn how to use VR uh, clinically? Or when, when can I take a seminar? And it's like, all right, well, in what area do you want to practice? I mean, I'm almost thinking there's a, a place for like a week-long soup-to-nuts VR training thing problem is clinicians aren't going to take a week off and go to it maybe Uh, but maybe it's a two-day thing where it's um you know it walks through exposure cognitive assessment pain management rehabilitation and you get a little dose you get to practice with all these different types of applications yeah Uh, well and i think i think the vr has a huge potential for any kind of training um, I mean, for, you know, for public speaking, for, you know, certain procedures, I mean, they're already using it in medicine, but I think, I think it's got a huge potential for training. Mm-hmm. Okay. I've got two more things before we'll stop for um, questions, even though I've got like another 35 questions on my list here. Um, all right. You know, the work I've done with virtual humans and virtual human interaction and AI, you worked on the Sim Coach project with us and, and so on. Do you see much of a future in that area? And with, and I have a, you know, I guess the thing I'm, I'm, I'm leaning towards is the ethical issue about when AI gets good enough, will virtual humans who are available 24 seven that never tire, that have an encyclopedic knowledge of clinical processes, remember everything that they say when they're interacting with a virtual patient. Will, uh, I personally think it'll be the most contentious issue in, in uh, mental health care in the next five, 10 years as the technology gets better. What, what, do, you, what do you think on this? Do you think- Well, we finish can... your question. Will virtual humans- Replace us. <laughs> Replace us. That's where I thought you were going. Um, 
you know, I, I wish that they could in a lot of ways because there are not enough people in the United States, in Georgia, in the world that do what I do. And, you know, even if there were, there are not enough people that have, you know, the resources to get to, you know, me and people that do what I do. And so I wish that you could kind of clone me or the better me who's, who's available 24 seven and remembers everything. Um, I would, I would be happy for that. I think enough people would still want to come see a real human um, that I don't think it would put a, out of business, but I think that it could reach a lot more people. Um, I know, I think you had some thoughts about the, the um, UK study with the virtual therapist with the, that had great right. results with the freakishly large hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I mean, I think, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, if we can get that good and, and with AI, we really should be able to. Um, well, I'm working, I, I'm I working on a number of projects of filling gaps, you know, like yeah. where there, like you say, there aren't enough clinicians or a person doesn't feel comfortable seeking help, kind of like the early sim coach concept, yeah. uh, a toe in the water to self understand and so on. Uh, we have a project now for health professionals um, um, that are possibly going through burnout, you know, with COVID and everything. Yeah. Uh, where they can interact with a, a virtual agent and answer questions or fill out forms for professional quality of life and then interact with the character to get some privately anonymously get some self-assessment. You're working on that because um, yep. we're working on an app for frontline healthcare workers that's kind of uh, exposure based called Messy Memories um, uh, you know, exposure based and, and with um, some other self-care. We'll have to uh, we'll have to swap notes after the call. Yeah, on, on what's yeah. Going because on. maybe it's, we can if yeah. you're assessing them and we can yeah. you know treat them with the app. We can. Right. Uh, that yeah. would be great. That would be yeah. great. Good. All right. Last question before we got to run to the um, uh, the audience questions. Um, all right. I ask this of everybody: If you had unlimited funding for two years, you could do anything you wanted. What would that be? So it would it would involve a lot of the stuff that we talked about. I would I would create a virtual assessment and therapy Shangri La. <laughs> I would I would try to have an answer to every single barrier that keeps somebody from getting the care that they need. Um, and so I would I would use it for assessment. I would use it for treatment and I would use the assessment. I mean, if this is unlimited, you know, it's going to be a really smart assessment to figure out exactly what you need. So, you know, it can figure out, you know, what kind of skills or if you need exposure therapy or if you need medication or if you need, you know, medical treatment and refer you to that. And then, you know, for the psychotherapy part that it can deliver it. And, and like we talked about, you know, maybe it's in conjunction with the medication if it shows that you need something to help with the exposure therapy. And then, you know, maybe it can also check in um, after treatment, you know, again, with the same assessment and to make sure things are on track or remind you if you need to practice things. So basically, a you know, a way to get everybody what they need. So as long as you're asking for a fantasy, that's it. Yeah. You're going to fund it. You're going to write that's the grant. <laughs> yeah. Super system, super yeah. VR metaverse. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. Sherry, do we have some uh, questions lined up here? I do. I, I just want to say that this has been just such an interesting session and uh, Dr. Rothbaum, your, um, you know, your experience and everything that you have done is so impressive. And um, I've just been fascinated. So uh, thank you so much. And thank you, Skip, for the wonderful job of close of, um, of moderating this. And Skip is the king. You. Skip's the king. Yeah. No, I'm I'm honored to be here. It's always a, a fun conversation to talk about this work. And it's always a fun conversation to talk about it with Skip. Well, we, uh, you know, uh, there's a quite, uh, we have a couple questions. One is around um, you know, Skip kind of uh, mentioned it uh, ever so slightly, but the metaverse, where do you see the metaverse or what's your view of the metaverse with uh, uh, medical VR? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's got a lot of potential and exactly what I said, because it's an activation paradigm. So for medical VR, um, for anything medical, very often we're taking people out of context. And sometimes we're not always measuring exactly what we need to measure and in the right context. And, and with the VR, we can. And I also, I should add a point. I am a stickler. Um, I try to be precise in language when we're talking about anything scientific. And with VR, I try to be precise that when I talk about virtual reality, I mean immersive virtual reality. Mm -hmm. um, so everything I've talked about is immersive virtual reality, that it's 365 degrees, 360 degrees um, you know, that we can you know, go under or around. It's totally immersive. When sometimes people are just playing videos in the head mount display, I don't call that VR. So just to okay. make a point of that. Well, that, that's great. Thank you. Um, one question here is, uh, there are so many VR treatment applications um, what is your opinion about them? And what are key components to build a standard, standout VR application to address unmet needs? So you've addressed the immersive piece of it. Right, so again, yeah. So I think that, that to call it real VR, um, that it does have to be immersive. And I'm gonna believe the data. Um, I, I, I'm a strong proponent of evidence-based care, evidence-based medicine. And so what that means is that we measure um, we assess people before and after, and we say what we're doing as an intervention and make sure it's replicable, that people can do it in the same way. And so I'm going to believe the data. I think that people should gather data on what they're doing and then disseminate that so that people can look at it. Wonderful. We have a question from our YouTube. Um, in Ukraine, there are millions that are traumatized, military, civilian adults, and children. What target group, in your opinion, would most benefit um, from the VR exposure? Oh, man. Everybody. Everybody. I mean, we're, you know, it, it's, it's breaking my heart what's happening there for so many reasons. And we're just, we're just seeing, you know, PTSD develop right before our eyes. We're seeing all of these kids' lives change, the trajectory of their lives are changing right before our eyes. So I agree with Skip, everybody, everybody could probably use something, even if it's a little virtual relaxation, you know, just a, a little virtual Mecca where they could escape and, and chill and replenish because this is just, it's heartbreaking. It's gonna be a tsunami um, of, um of challenges way after the last shot is fired um you know and certainly you know very interesting i had a, a fulbright scholar in our lab um back in 2016 from the ukraine and she wanted to build out a virtual donbass uh, mm -hmm. because she said even from the 2014 and prior incursions that there were a lot of people that were still you know having problems I can't even, so when I think about the pitch that she made about what, you know, wanting to build this out and we never got the funding, we were, we were hustling all over the place, trying to get international funding and so on. Never got the funding to build it. Uh, we got all the source imagery, got library of, of imagery and, and so on stories. Um, but now when I look at what's going on there, we see it every day in slow motion. Uh, and, and we're seeing that much of, yeah the 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 horrific pain you know we see buildings getting wrecked well you know there's people's lives that are getting wrecked and yeah. and i think you know at some point you know um maybe we'll be part of a task force that will try to move whether it's vr whether it's mobile apps whether it's in you know it has you know evidence-based uh, approaches to um to try to try to as best you can turn things around at some point uh, for these folks. They don't deserve to have this suffering. Oh, Nobody does. Totally agree. Yeah. So um, there's one, uh, I think uh, we have time for one last question and uh, this can be for actually uh, one or both of you. What's the biggest challenge for VR in mental health now and how would the future be? 
Yeah, if we can both take it. I mean, I, and I think we've talked about it, you know, so I think, I think the cost and clinician training, you know, getting clinicians to try something different and then especially if it costs even a couple of hundred dollars, if it's something different and they're not that into trying it, why should I spend a couple of hundred dollars on that when I can uh, get a new phone? Yeah, I, I think look at where it's getting a lot of traction now, like in uh, in pain management, acute, mm -hmm. acute, acute pain management in hospitals because it's low cost and, uh, you know, the, the science is there. And so. If you operate from the perspective, you you take something we theoret we know has good theory and is evidence based in the real world. Now can we amplify it and get it out? So part of the 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 friction there is in um, clinician training and not having a having a unified platform like what Barbara was mentioning in her in her dream for a two year project is to have not have five different headsets that all have different proprietary software on it, but have one unified platform and 5G connection, you know, library of the Shangri-La of um, every kind of uh, VR type of content that could be made available. That's where we have to get. Yeah, um, so meet a need, you know, figure out where it's needed. So all along, we've said we don't create virtual environments just because we can, and it's cool. We're, we're creating where it can make something better, or easier, or more feasible. So, you know, figure out what that need is and then make it accessible. Great. Thank you so much for answering these questions. I think um, just in closing, um, I wanted to remind everyone uh, we have our FDA study sites that are going on. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the event, uh, we're conducting clinical studies for FDA approval of our virtual reality attention tracker. Uh, if you're interested in participating, you can scan the QR code at the bottom right corner of the screen to fill out an interest form, and we'll reach out to you to check for eligibility. Um, compensation may be available based on uh, the site location. So more information, um, please contact info at cognitiveleap.com. So once again, then, I want to thank you so much for joining this event um, in the Tech Meets Mental Health Series. I hope you've learned from our amazing speaker today. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosenbaum, and thank you again to our host, Dr. Rizzo. For our audience, the video recordings of this event will be available on YouTube on our channel at Cognitive Leap Solutions, Inc. Please feel free to share it with anyone who might be interested in the topic. We look forward to seeing you again at our next event and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks again. Thanks, Thank Barbara. You. Thanks, Skip. Thanks, Sherry. Thank Thanks you all. Bye-bye. We'll, we'll talk over happy hour on Friday. Absolutely.